Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. Hey guys, this is Peter with the Command Valley, bringing you the latest episode of Duel of the Peaks. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video and our channel. If you want to check out their new and improved store and support the channel while doing it, check out the affiliate link in the description below. If you want to support the channel directly, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley for some awesome perks like early access to our videos and exclusive live deck techs. Sign up today. Today I am here with Caleb. Hey guys. We are going to be narrating this episode of Duel of the Peaks. Do you want to introduce the theme of the video and the challenges that we have? Yeah, so the theme for today's video is we all brought our favorite homebrews. And the challenges for this game are, as always, three points for winning the game. And then we're sticking with this one. We like it. The three point, Another three point challenge is cast your commander exactly once during the game. Then for two points, whoever draws the most card in a single turn. And then for one more point, each player can play your commander the first turn that you are able. And that means basically whenever you have the open mana that you would need to cast your commander, then you cast it by the end of that turn. That's that's the criteria for that one point challenge. So for instance, Mael that Caleb is playing costs a red, a white, and a green. Once he has all of those open, he needs to cast it that turn or he loses out on that one point. Let's go over the opening hands and the personal challenges and then we'll get into the game. Peter is playing Winota Joiner of Forces. He has an opening hand of Dockside Extortionist, Verge Rangers, Palace Jailer, Anointed Procession, Terror of the Peaks, Cavern of Souls, and a Mountain. And his personal challenge is to cast three humans from his hand. Wow, that's a pretty good opening hand. <laughs> I see yeah. a lot of threats there. <laughs> yeah. And Griffin is playing Send Triplets, and his opening hand consists of Path to Exile, Rapid Hybridization, Dovin's Veto, Mnemonic Betrayal, Cape of Coilus, an Island, and a Plains. And his personal challenge is to cast a spell from each opponent, whether it be from their hand or anywhere else. Lots of low mana uh, interaction he has there in the, his hand. That's like yes, kind of scary. <laughs> Caleb is playing Mael the Anima. His opening hand is Birds of Paradise, Xanagos God of Revels, Austere Command, Maze of Ith, Rootbound Crag, Reflecting Pool, and a Forest. And his personal challenge is to have at least... 18 CMC from creatures on his board, just at any given time. All right, and then Landon is playing Corvold, Fey Cursed King, and his opening hand has a Viscera Seer, Kodama's Reach, Cultivate, Grim Haro Specs, Rootbound Crag, Spire Garden, and a Mountain. And his personal challenge is to have Corvold eat four creatures. And what we mean by that is that Corvold has an enter the battlefield and attack trigger that makes him sacrifice a permanent, and his goal is to sacrifice four creatures with that ability. Just to quickly go over where the points stand for the season, Peter is currently in the lead with 52 points, Griffin is second place with 44 points, Landon has 29 points, and Caleb has 26 points. Peter wins the die roll and gets to go first. Good luck, everybody. Peter starts his turn. He draws and plays a Cavern of Souls, naming humans, and he passes. Wow, that's a really good first turn land. <laughs> Griffin then goes to his turn, draws and plays a Caves of Coilos, and passes. Caleb goes to his turn, draws, plays a Forest, and then taps it to play Birds of Paradise. Then he passes. That's also a pretty good first turn. Yeah. Lennon goes to his turn, draws, plays a snow covered forest, and passes. Going to turn two, Peter draws, he plays a mountain, and he passes the turn. Griffin draws, plays an island, and passes as well. Caleb untaps and draws, he plays a root bound crag, and then he taps out to cast Mael because he now has that three mana that he needs. So he gets three points for casting his commander once, and one point for casting his commander at the first opportunity. So this challenge of having to cast your commander immediately, as soon as you have access to mana to be able to play it, is a real big challenge because 
we know that our opponents have removal and normally you don't want to play your commander until the opportune moment and it's not a really good turn to play Mael because only having three mana, only having access to three mana means that it could be at least three more turns before Caleb is able to activate her ability. Caleb has nothing else to do, so he passes the turn over to Landon. Landon draws and plays a rootbound crag. Same as you. Nice. Literally the best card in magic is in my hand. <laughs> oh no. I put this in my deck. Spore frog. He taps his rootbound crag to play a spore frog. Very, very good card. Well yeah, we just heard that it's literally the best card Liter in magic. Literally the best. Yeah, I've I've had specifically trouble with that against my window to deck before, so we'll see how this goes. Yeah. <laughs> Landon chips the turn over to Peter, and Peter starts turn three. Peter draws and plays a Rugged Prairie, then he taps three to cast Verge Rangers, which lets him look at the top card of his library at any time, and if he has fewer lands than one of his opponents, then he can play a land off the top. With nothing else and no land to play off the top, he passes the turn. Griffin draws, simply plays an island, and passes over to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws. He taps one for a soul ring, which is probably why he was okay with playing that Mael on the first turn. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, he then plays a reflecting pool as his land for turn. Taps out, paying five to cast Xanagos, God of Revels. He goes to combat. There's a trigger on Xanagos. He targets Mael and doubles Mael's power. And then he swings Mael at Griffin. Griffin takes four damage. Satisfied, he passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws. He plays a Spire Garden. Then he taps out to cast Kodama's Reach. He searches for a Swamp onto the battlefield tapped, and he puts a Swamp into his hand. With that, he passes. Peter untaps and draws. He looks at the top card of his library. Then he pays two to cast Dockside Extortionist. There are two artifacts and enchantments on the battlefield that Xanagos and Soul Ring, so he creates two treasures. And he has no further actions, he passes the turn. Griffin draws, he plays a Prairie Stream, and he passes. It doesn't look like Griffin's been doing a lot this game so far. Yeah, but he does have a lot of open mana, so this is kind of scary. Yeah, he has four open mana. Next turn, his he can probably cast his commander. Um, yeah, and we know that Sin Triplets is a very interactive deck. Yeah, the guys are definitely going to have to keep their eyes open. All right, Caleb goes to his turn, untaps and draws. He then pays six mana and activates Mael. Spin the wheels. So Mael lets you look at the top five cards of your library and choose a creature with power five or greater and put it straight onto the battlefield, put the rest onto the bottom of the library. So his deck is loaded with lots of really big creatures oh, that can yeah. exploit this. So he chooses Ulamog, the infinite gyre, to put onto the battlefield. Speaking of big creatures. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily uh, for everybody, the cast trigger does not go off, so <laughs> Caleb does not get to get to destroy anything, but it's Ulamog. <laughs> but it's Ulamog, and he has a Xanagos, so it's coming at someone. Yes. Um, he hits his personal challenge here, uh, getting two points for having at least 18 CMC on the battlefield. I think that happened a lot sooner than the guys thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> Which usually happens with Caleb's personal challenges. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Having pulled Ulamog off of the top, he heads to combat. There's a trigger on Xenagos. He targets Ulamog to double his power and toughness and give him haste so he can swing at someone. In response to that trigger, Griffin casts Path to Exile, targeting the Ulamog. It resolves, Ulamog gets exiled, and Caleb chooses to search his library for a planes and put it into play tapped. So, something about this interaction here is that Caleb was trying to convince the rest of the table, especially Griffin with all of his open mana, to let him play this because he... We've all played against Peter's deck multiple times. We know how crazy it gets. And so Caleb wanted to swing this at Peter and make sure that everybody knew that that's where it was going. But Griffin really didn't want to lock somebody out of the game, which is fair. And so that's why he decided to exile Ulamog despite Caleb trying to say, hey, look, I'm swinging at Peter. But then Griffin says that he'll only do it if Peter owes him a favor. Yeah, and, and Peter happily agrees to that because he he did not want to sacrifice four yeah. things. <laughs> Makes sense. Annihilator is crazy. Yeah, Annihilator is pretty crazy, and he's definitely been on the receiving end of that before, playing yeah. against Mael in the past, so that's what? that's um, 
that's a deal that Peter is willing to make. Makes sense. All right, moving out of combat, Caleb plays a Canopy Vista as his land for turn, and he passes. Landon goes to his turn, untaps, and draws. He taps three for a Cultivate. He finds a forest and puts it onto the battlefield tapped, and then he puts a mountain in his hand. He then plays the mountain as his land for turn, and then he taps one black mana to cast Viserys here, and he passes. And while he technically does have enough lands to generate enough mana for Corval at this point, he doesn't have to cast him because he didn't have that open mana at any point, which is why he casts the Cultivate first. Very smart. Moving to turn five, Peter untaps and draws. He plays a Plains from the top of his library using Verge Ranger's ability because now Landon has more lands than him. So good. He then pays four to cast his commander, Winota Joiner of Forces, because he has enough mana at this point. So he gets three points for casting his commander once and one point for casting it at the first opportunity. Nice. He then goes to combat. Caleb responds to the combat by tapping his remaining one to Path to Exile, targeting Winota. Uh, What comes around goes around? (laughs) What comes around goes around. It resolves. Winota goes back to the command zone. Peter gets a Plains from the Path to Exile, which enters tapped. And then uh, Peter still goes to combat and swings Verge Rangers and Dockside Extortionists at Caleb, hitting Caleb for four. After combat, he moves through his main phase and passes. Griffin untaps and draws, and Griffin is ready to cash in on that favor that Peter owes him. Oh, you know he is. He taps out for Factor Fiction. So he pulls a Chromatic Orrery, Paradox Haze, Kunaros Hound of Athreos, Stryonic Resonator, and a Swamp off the top. And Peter needs to separate these into two piles, and then Griffin gets one into his hand and one into his graveyard. This is really good politicking for Griffin. Uh, This is the exact type of card that you want to cash in a favor for. And even though he asks for all five cards, which you can do, you can ask your opponent to put all five into one pile and zero in the other pile and choose the pile with five cards, Peter is still going to separate those so that he can't take full advantage of it, but he does help him out. Yeah, so Peter chooses to put the the Swamp and the Stryonic Resonator into one pile and puts the other three into the other pile. The reasoning was that Stryonic Resonator and Paradox Haze both double the trigger on the Send Triplets, yeah. and I he felt like it was a little bit too much to give him both so that he could potentially control everyone's turn on one of the turns, Um, especially with that Chromatic Ori giving him a lot of mana. So he then plays a Plains as his land for turn and passes. Caleb goes to his turn, untaps and draws. He plays a Maze of Ith as his land for turn. He then pays six to activate Mael. Looks at the top five and he chooses World Spine Worm to enter the battlefield. Another 11 CMC. Oh yeah. (laughs) Big fatty coming onto the battlefield. He then goes to combat, Xanagos triggers, targeting the world spide worm and giving it haste. Griffin responds to that trigger again and casts a swords to plowshares, targeting the world spine worm before his power and toughness can double. Uh, yep. So it resolves, the worm get, gets exiled and Caleb gains 15 life, going up to 51. This is a good idea because Griffin already knew that he was going to exile whatever was coming either his way, which it was probably coming his way, or wherever. He wanted to do it before Xanagos could double the power because he didn't want Caleb to gain 30 life. So he (laughs) said, make him gain 15 life and not even worry about who he's swinging at. (laughs) Caleb moves to the end of his combat and passes. Landon untaps and draws. He plays a Swamp as his land return. Then he taps three to cast Wood Elves. When it enters, he searches for an Overgrown Tomb, puts it onto the battlefield untapped, so it sho- he shocks it in for two. And then he taps the rest of his mana to cast Corvold. When Corvold enters the battlefield, he sacrifices the Wood Elves to its ability. And then with that sacrifice trigger, Corvold gets a plus one, plus one counter, and Landon draws a card. Wow, he's getting some serious value off of that Wood Elves. Yeah, and he's getting a lot of points here, too. He gets six points right here because he casts his commander once for three points. He he used the first turn that he could to cast it, and he gets two points for having drawn the most cards in a single turn. That's awesome. Which right now is only two cards, but still, it's... Six points in one turn is awesome. Six points in one turn is pretty awesome. Satisfied, he passes the turn. I love how Landon is just 
over here ramping. <laughs> That's like <laughs> yeah. all he's doing. Uh, and and he, he comes out with Corvold with like nine mana on the board so already. Crazy. And, and it's, uh, it's only t- the end of turn five and... You know, everyone else is at, at each other's throat <laughs> trying, trying to survive, and Landon's just <laughs> biding his time. <laughs> Moving on to turn six, Peter untaps and draws. He plays a mountain as his land for turn. He then taps six to cast Winota for the second time, so he loses those three points for casting his commander a second time. He's looking for somewhere to send his Dockside Extortionist so that he can get an activation off of Winota. Dude, you can attack me with the Dockside and I won't block it. Yeah? Yeah. That's actually pretty advantageous. So not only is Landon playing all the way over there in the corner by himself, building up his board, he's also making friends. He lets Peter swing that Dockside Extortionist, which is really good for Peter. This is exactly what Peter needs. He needs a friend that he can swing this at so that he can get more creatures on the field. This triggers Winota once, and Winota's trigger, it happens whenever a non-human creature attacks. He gets to look at the top six cards of his library, choose a human creature from among them, bring it onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. It gains indestructible until end of turn, and the rest of the cards go on the bottom in a random order. So he looks at the top six cards, and he grabs Geist Honored Monk. That enters with two 1-1 Flying Spirits, and then he declares the monk as an attacker at Caleb. That's some good synergy right there. Geist sure. Honored Monk. Geist Honor Monk is incredible in this deck. Yeah, and it's it's already a six six. Yeah. It, just from the few creatures on the board, and it's gonna get even bigger. Uh, Caleb responds to the Geist Honored Monk swinging at him by tapping Maze of Ith to take it out of combat and untap it, and then the Dockside goes at Landon. Landon takes one, going down to thirty seven. Nice. And with that, he passes. Overall, a really good turn for Peter. Griffin goes to his turn, untaps, and draws. He plays an island, and now he has enough mana to cast Send Triplets, so he pays five to cast Send Triplets. And so he gets his four points, three for casting his commander, and one for casting it once he had enough open mana. He then passes the turn, and Caleb responds to the end step by casting Swords to Plowshares, targeting Griffin's Send Triplets. Again, what goes around comes around. <laughs> <laughs> We, we have seen two swords and two Path to Exiles <laughs> yeah. already this game. Very efficient removal coming from these crazy white players. <laughs> For sure. It resolves, Sent Triplets goes back to the command zone, and Griffin gains three life, going up to 39. Caleb then goes to his turn, untaps, and draws. He taps a forest to cast Sylvan Tutor, which will let him search his library for a card and put it on top of his library, obviously ho- hoping to get it out with Mael. Griffin responds to that by casting Rapid Dehybridization, targeting Mael, which will destroy it and make Caleb make a 3-3 Frog Blizzard. Caleb responds to that cast by... Paying six and tapping Mael to activate her before she's forced to be destroyed. He looks at the top five and very quickly grabs a Blightsteel Colossus <laughs> to put onto the battlefield. Um, what? Where did that come from? Where did that come from? <laughs> After that, Griffin's removal spell resolves, sending Mael back to the command zone, and Caleb gets a 3 3 Frog Lizard. Worst so- trade deal in the history of trade deals. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvan Tutor then resolves, and Caleb tutors up a blazing archon and puts it on top of his library because he figures that if he can't be swinging at anybody then he should at least stop people from swinging at him at this point lannon is going to try to make a deal with griffin let's go to that do you have a way of dealing with this why would you do that uh because yes. i don't i don't have a way of killing an indestructible thing i absolutely do all of the things in my deck have to do with destroying things Trying. And you're you're offering to give up your spore frog. I am giving up my spore frog. That's so nice. A terrible wow. Idea. No, it's not a terrible idea. Yeah. Because if Tim dies, and he's the only one that has a way of exiling that, and I have no cards in my deck to deal with that, it's a terrible idea. No, it's smart. It's a terrible. It is big galaxy just, brain. Just make me sack it. <laughs> what does he think I'm playing? <laughs> If you can't you leave, good stuff, stuck, then... I did build a good deck. Oh. I'm building it in such a way that I'm making him deal with your threat. With those deals struck, Caleb is still going to head to combat. Yep. So, so he goes to combat. Xanagos triggers. It actually resolves at this point, targeting Blightsteel Colossus and makes him a hasty 22-22 with Infect. And Trample. And Trample. 
Caleb declares the Colossus to attack Griffin, as expected. And Landon responds to that by sacrificing the Spore Frog to prevent all combat damage this turn. That triggers Corvold. Landon draws a card and puts a plus one plus one counter on Corvold. Caleb responds to the Frog activation by tapping his Maze of Ith to take Colossus out of combat and then tap it. And with nothing else, he passes the turn. Yeah, so Caleb's probably figuring that he needs a scary blocker to mitigate any attacks that may or may not come from Peter's side of the board. Yeah, because he's starting to build up a board and it's starting to look a little bit a little bit more threatening than yeah. it was before. Yeah, it's a little scary now. Yeah. Landon untaps and draws. He plays a mountain as his, his land for turn, and then he has some spells to cast. He taps three for Grim Heart Specs, taps two for Regrowth, targeting the Spore Frog in his graveyard and getting it back to his hand. And then he taps one to recast Spore Frog. That's just a really good card to have around. Yes, it is. Yeah. We've already seen Spore Frog stop somebody from dying this game. It's just like we said, Spore Frog is the number one best card in Magic. <laughs> All right, Landon goes to combat. He swings Corvold at Caleb. Trigger on the attack, he sacrifices Viseraseer. On the sacrifice, it triggers the Grim Horror Specs and Corvold, so... Landon draws two cards and gets a plus one plus one counter on Corvold. Damage then resolves and Caleb takes eight damage going down to 43. He then passes the turn. Peter starts his turn seven, untaps and draws. He then goes straight into combat, swinging two spirits at Caleb and a Dockside Extortionist at Griffin. Three triggers for Winota go on the stack. The first trigger, he gets Knight of the White Orchid onto the battlefield. That lets him search his library for a plane, since Landon has more lands than him, and he puts that onto the battlefield untapped. He points the Knight of the White Orchid to swing at Landon. His second trigger resolves. He gets Gerard Weatherlight Captain onto the battlefield, and he swings that at Griffin. That is some fantastic insurance. And his third trigger resolves getting Hanware Garrison onto the battlefield, also swinging at Griffin. Griffin will take six damage, and Lennon and Caleb will both take two damage. Going to his second main phase, he plays Hanware Battlements as his land for turn. He taps five and the Battlements to meld the Garrison and the Battlements together into Hanware the Writhing Township. Peter then pays the rest of his mana, sacrificing the two treasures he made earlier with Dockside to cast Anointed Procession, which is going to make the Writhing Township even worse. Yeah. If that wasn't scary already for these guys, it is really, really scary for them now. Yeah. He then passes the turn. Griffin goes to his untapped step, draws, and plays a Swamp. He now has to fulfill his promise that he made to Landon that he would deal with the Blightsteel Colossus. But Griffin says he can deal with two things on the board. So there's some discussion on what should be destroyed. Okay. What two things should I get rid of? Hmm, there's a really big elephant in the room. I mean, I think the two biggest threats, there are three big threats, four actually. Known to procession, and we're twice of Colossus and Corporal. If I get rid of Renota, I can just play Renota again. Yeah. So maybe get rid of Gerard. If you get rid of Gerard, then I can maybe deal with the rest of his board. He taps out to cast Chromatic Orrery. Having decided what he's going to target, he taps the Orrery and pays three of the mana to cast Mnemonic Betrayal. He casts Caleb's Path to Exile and Swords to Plowshares from his graveyard, both one mana each. The Path targets Blightsteel Colossus, and the Swords targets Gerard. Both of them resolve and they're both exiled. Peter gains three life, going up to 43, and Caleb elects not to search for that land due to that blazing archon sitting on top of his library. He didn't want to shuffle that back in. It's the principle of the thing. I think that normally you still would have gone for the land, especially since Caleb can't even cast the blazing archon on his next turn, but it's just the principle of the thing. Right. You do not want the card you tutored being shuffled back in. This is an amazing card from Griffin, and... It's just absolutely insane that he's getting two more exile effects out of his deck with this mnemonic betrayal. Yeah. Such a good card. And, and not only that, the same two. <laughs> yeah. We've seen three Path to Exiles and three Swords to Plowshares this game. Yeah, it's almost as if Griffin were running multiple Path to Exiles in his deck. <laughs> Tapped out, Griffin passes the turn. Caleb untaps and draws. He goes straight into combat. Xenagos triggers and targets the Frog Lizard to double its power. He then swings it at Griffin. Griffin takes the six, going down to 27. Moving to his second main phase, Caleb taps six to cast Austere Command. 
Landon responds to this by sacrificing his Spore Frog. That triggers Corbold and Grim Horror Specs. Corbold gets a counter and Landon draws two cards. Peter then responds to the Austere Command by playing a Flawless Maneuver for free because he has his commander out, giving all of his creatures indestructible. You guys. <laughs> with that on the stack, Landon responds with an Assassin's Trophy, targeting Hanware the Writhing Township. It resolves the township is destroyed and Peter finds a planes to put into play. Then all of his creatures gain indestructible and austere command resolves. Everyone's creatures but Peter's are wiped. You guys, if you have been watching this show, you have seen over the course of this season that Caleb has played austere command twice and it's been countered by Peter. So during this game, he is feeling great. He's like, sweet, Peter is tapped out. There's no way, there's absolutely no way that Peter is going to stop this austere command. And he does. <laughs> <laughs> he still does. Uh, I think that Caleb needs to take all of the austere commands out of his deck at this point during the when, season. <laughs> when are you going to learn that this is, uh, Peter's just immune to this, yeah. you know? <laughs> At this point, it's just a meme in our playgroup. Uh -huh. <laughs> here comes Austere Command. It's not going to do what it wants to do because Peter's here. <laughs> <laughs> if Austere Command had a kryptonite, it would be Peter. Moving on from the Austere Command, Caleb taps out to cast his Sylvan Library and passes the turn. Lennon goes to his turn untapped and draws. He plays a Temple of the False God as his land for turn. He taps two to cast Talisman of Resilience. And then he taps four for Grave Pact. So you have a way to deal with Blind Steel Colossus. I actually top decked that, so. And then he taps two more for Blood Artist. Ooh. Two very good cards for his deck if he um, gets a whole bunch of tokens out onto the battlefield. Yeah. So we could see that later. Satisfied, he passes the turn. Peter goes to untap and draw. He plays a Plains from the top of his library using that Verge Rangers. He then taps five to cast Terror of the Peaks. Man, that is a beautiful card. Also possibly going to be everyone's downfall. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> uh, he then goes to combat, swinging two spirits at Landon and Dockside Extortionist at Caleb. So Winota will trigger three times. The first trigger, he gets Evangel of Heliot off the top, which enters the battlefield and creates a number of 1-1 one -one soldiers equal to your devotion to white. At this time, his devotion is 9, and with Anointed Procession, that makes 18 1-1 one -one soldiers. Um, excuse me? How many? What? 18 1-1 one -one soldiers. <laughs> Holy cow! Uh, so that's 19 1 damage triggers coming off of the Terror of the Peaks. He divides 6 damage between each of his opponents and deals 1 extra damage to Caleb for good measure. Ah, uh, for good measure, yes. Yes. <laughs> Evangel enters swinging at Griffin. We know the second trigger then resolves and he gets Angrath's Marauders off of the top, which will double all damage done to permanent and players. They're not just going to die, they're going to die very quickly. Terror of the Peaks triggers again. He elects to deal 8 damage to Caleb and the Marauders are swinging at Landon. His third trigger resolves, Darien, King of Keldor, gets off the top, the Terror of the Peaks triggers, he deals six damage directly to Griffin, and then he swings it at Griffin. Caleb responds to the declared attackers by tapping Mazavith to pull Dockside Extortionist out of combat, and then damage resolves, Landon takes 12, and Griffin takes seven. This is where we see the absolutely insane power from Winota. And if you guys didn't already catch it, go watch our deck tech on this. It's absolutely the most incredible Boros deck I've ever seen. I, I don't think that there's a better Boros deck than Winota. Peter is satisfied with his turn and he passes. Griffin goes to untap and draw. He plays a Swamp and then cast Send Triplets for seven, losing those three points for casting it again. He then taps three for Fate Spinner, which will make everybody choose a phase to skip on their turn, which will be either their draw phase, main phase, or combat phase. Yeah, and it's both main phases. Yeah, it's, both, it's each instance of those phases. So yeah, that's a really powerful control piece in his deck. And yeah. it's, he's hoping that that will help mitigate against Winota. He passes the turn. Caleb then untaps, and in his upkeep, he chooses to skip combat, which does mean that his Xenagos trigger isn't going to ever happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is unfortunate, but he really couldn't skip that draw or main phase either because he didn't have anything. Yeah, if he skips the draw phase, then he's going to lose out on the Sylvan Library trigger. Exactly. So, speaking of which, he goes to his draw step. He draws three cards, puts 
two of them back. Then he taps three for Faber Elder and unable to do anything else, he passes the turn. Landon untaps and in his upkeep, he chooses to skip combat as well. He then draws. He plays a Terra Morphic Expanse as his land for turn, pays seven to cast Corvold, losing those three points for casting his commander again. When he enters the battlefield, he'll sacrifice Talisman of Resilience. And then when that sacrifice, Corvold will get a counter and Landon draws a card. He then taps to sacrifice Terramorphic Expanse, triggering Corvold again, getting another counter and drawing another card. And then he searches for a mountain, entering the battlefield tapped. He then taps three to cast Ashnod's Altar, and with nothing else, passes the turn. Peter goes to his turn nine, untaps, and he chooses to skip his draw step instead of his main phase or combat. Not combat? <laughs> yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> Which actually works out in his favor because the Verge Rangers lets him pull a planes off the top of his library and put it immediately into play. So he didn't really need to draw. It's almost as if you were able to look at the top card of your library and knew that that and was there. And knew that was there. Yeah, you know, it, yeah. It's yeah. pretty nice. Peter then goes to combat. He swings 18 soldiers at Caleb, Terror of the Peaks at Griffin, and two spirits and Geist Honored Monk at Landon. So 21 Winota triggers will go on the stack. Put on your seatbelts. Landon responds to the triggers going on the stack by sacrificing Blood Artist to Ashnod's Altar, getting two mana into his mana pool. That will trigger Korvold to let him draw a card and put a counter on him. That'll trigger Blood Artist to drain Peter for one. And then he has a trigger on the Grave Pact and each opponent sacrifices a creature. Landon then casts Arachnogenesis using the floating Ashnod's Altar mana, creating three spiders, because he has three creatures attacking him, and prevents all combat damage dealt by non-spiders this turn. So all of those things that are swinging aren't going to do any damage. So Peter's going to have to rely on those Terror of the Peaks triggers to finish out the game. Yeah, well, he is getting 21 triggers off of his commander, so there's a good chance. There's a good chance, yeah. Uh, Landon then sacrifices the three spiders to Ashnod's altar, adding six mana to his mana pool, triggering Corvold three times, drawing three cards, and adding three more counters to him, and then triggering Grave Pack three times, each opponent sacrifices three creatures. Corvold's still doing stuff. <laughs> He's awesome. Then those Winota triggers will begin to resolve. The first trigger, he gets Benalish Marshall off the top. That triggers Terror of the Peaks, and he does six damage to Griffin's face. That will also pump up each of his creatures plus one, plus one, so that makes the Terror of the Peaks doubling everything that much better. Yeah. We know the second trigger resolves Pia and Kieran Nilar enter the battlefield. They enter with four Thopters because of Anointed Procession, and all of those trigger Terror of the Peaks. He deals four damage to Griffin's face, finishing him off, and he deals 18 damage to Caleb. Uh, his third trigger is a whiff. He doesn't get anything off of that. And his fourth trigger is a Silver Wing Squadron, which has power and toughness equal to the number of creatures he controls. Of course it does. Why wouldn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, he uses the Terror of the Peaks trigger to finish Landon off, doing all that damage to him. Yeah, seems good. Yeah. 17 more triggers left. Trigger number five is another whiff. And then trigger number six is a Loyal Apprentice, Terror of the Peaks triggers, dealing four damage to Caleb. And then trigger number seven is a Dranith Magistrate, triggering Terror of the Peaks and dealing four more damage to Caleb, finishing him off, and Peter wins. Yeah, with 14 more Winota triggers left to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even need to get to the uh, to every single human in his deck to, <laughs> yeah. to, to win. That was awesome. Like I said before, I absolutely love that Winota deck. It is so much fun to watch just go absolutely crazy i love it i think that this is such a perfect showcase of it and i think that a lot of people can start including a deck like this or or just winota in their play group now because after, after seeing something like this i think that a lot of people doubt the power of boros but there have been so many good cards lately coming out of magic the gathering that has been helping out Boros. Yeah, for sure. And and we saw Akiri in Zendikar Rising, which is another great one. Oh yeah, we've got two Boros decks winning back to back. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, this is a, a good showing by them. All right, so play the game. What what do you, what are your thoughts about play the game, Peter? <sighs> well, I think I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean there were a lot of of plays that save someone's life especially at the, in the very early game with you with Caleb swinging a whole bunch of really big nasties at people that would potentially have just killed them right on the spot yeah but yeah what were what are you thinking I think that the best play of the game 
was flawless maneuver. Yeah, flawless flawless maneuver against austere command was definitely the point of the game where all hope was lost for everyone else, and Peter was just like, "Heck yes, this is my game." And it was so out of nowhere, like we've talked about with these free spells. They're so good. They're yeah. so good. They they are so good. A, a little bit too good, if you ask me. Well, yeah. yeah, it was it was the perfect lore because I'm sitting there thinking, there's no way, there's no way there's gonna be a response to this, and there was. Yeah. And it was the perfect response. Yeah, and and yeah, that that saved Peter's board, and and everyone else's board was wiped, and you know, he, Peter already had such an established board that. It was it was basically game point at that point. I mean, yeah, those those earlier plays getting rid of the Colossus and the Worm and the and the Eldrazi were like essential for for the game to continue going. Yeah. Um. And and definitely Peter would not have gotten that advantage if if Caleb would have gotten through with Ulamog, but. But flawless maneuver. But, but, but <laughs> yeah, that definitely had the most advantage out of everyone. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah you were able to save a lot of stuff with that card. Yeah, play play of the game definitely goes to flawless maneuver. Now, what do you think about the MVP card? I think cards? we have uh, two cards that are pretty much the same thing, and that's Swords to Plowshares and Path to Exile. We saw so many of them flying around. Griffin was able to exile so many huge threats and it was, and it's so cheap. And I also had swords and path to exile and those, those come at such an opportune moment. Those were able to keep the game going. Just like you said. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I mean, those, those path to exile and swords to plowshares, we saw three casts of each Mm -hmm. and those were essential for controlling the board, keeping down the big heavy hit hitters until Peter had a big enough board state to just win. So it, it also kept Winota back. If if I wouldn't have exiled your Winota, you would have just gone crazy way before this. Yeah. It probably would have ended on turn six. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Once the Winota train starts going, if you can't stop it a, with with a board wipe or something else, then then it's very hard to stop. Yeah. If you guys want to play Boros, play Winota. And play Peter's deck. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, guys. Let's cover the final point totals at the end of the game. So, Caleb started the game with 26 points, and he gained 6 points this game. He got 1 point for casting his commander when he was first able to. He got 2 points for achieving his personal challenge of having at least 18 CMC on the battlefield at some point. And he got three points for only casting his commander once. And that's very smart play from him because everyone else failed that challenge. Everyone else cast their commander an additional time. So Yeah, it's usually me that does that. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. I've it, learned. Turn, turn it around on everyone. So he ends the game with 32 points. Landon started the game with 29 points and he got three points this game. He got one point for casting his commander when he was first able to, and two points for getting the most card draw in a single turn throughout the game. He held that challenge the entire game. Yep. Yeah, and not even the Sylvan Library could really match that, uh, the the value that Corvold was giving him. So. Yep, it got close, but it only results in three cards drawn each time. Yeah, definitely. So he ends the game with 32 points, meaning Caleb and Landon are now tied again. All right, and then Griffin started the game out with 44 points, he got one point during the game for casting his commander when he was able to, so he is he is ending this game with 45 points. And then Peter started this game with 52 points, and he got four points this game, one from casting his commander when he was able to, and three points for winning. This was a super fun game, and we hope that you guys all enjoyed it. If you're interested in supporting the channel directly, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash command valley again it supports us directly we have a discord as a as a perk so you can go and hang out with us when we're brewing decks and just talking about everything we're in the middle of commander legends spoiler season right now and we are always talking about those spoilers so come check it out it's a lot of fun we have a, a lot of exclusive things that you can get through there just go and look at the tiers there there's a lot of really exciting ones and for pretty affordable, if, yeah. you, if you ask me. Yeah, we're definitely handing out some pretty good deals. And we, like Peter said, we are always on that Discord. So yeah, come chat with us. 
Uh, thank you to GameGrid again for sponsoring this video and our channel. You can go through the affiliate link in the description to check out their store, buy cards that you like from this game. Maybe you need that Flawless Maneuver now. Or a, a Winota. I know that they have at least 20 of those in stock. So <laughs> you go, go there and check it out. They ha ship nationwide so you can get your cards anywhere in the United States. And they're... And from what I've heard from our patrons, they're shipping really fast as well. So yeah. join us every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time for our live streams. Griffin is always on there playing Brawl on Arena, and he is super fun to watch. Also, follow us at Command Valley P1 on Twitter and like us on Facebook. The link is down below. We super appreciate all and any support that you give us. Additionally, if you want to listen to any of our other podcast episodes or watch our videos, check out the other videos on our channel or check us out on Spotify, Amazon, Google, or iTunes. We're on all of those in our audio only formats for our deck techs and our podcast episodes. So go check those out. Stay tuned for more Commander Legends, deck techs, spoiler talk, and things like that over the next couple of weeks. We'll be making a lot of videos for that. So stay tuned. Stay safe out there, guys. Have thanks. a great weekend. Yep, thanks.